Good morning, guys. So, I'm still processing going through Sean Christie revealing truth's video that he says that I'm lying about him and that type of stuff. So, each point that he brings up, I'm going through and I'm making a video about it. That way, when he says that I'm lying about, that he said that he would never do a video exposing the Freemasons. I've got a screenshot from April, I think it was 11th or 14th or something like that from 2021 that says I'll never do a vi it may not say never. It says that he won't do a video exposing the Freemasons and their stuff. There's another one that I, this is four years of us going back and forth and thinking that we had a equal understanding of what's going on. So, this video today is Sean Christie is participating in the Colossian heresy. Now, this is a set of teachings that's very well established inside the heretical church. And what Sean is doing is just passing on a set of teachings that he hasn't fully researched. So... When I'm doing this, I'm not doing this, trying to come after him in a let's attack Sean type of way. All scripture is God breathed for correction and building up of the assembly, correct? So, Sean put, the, there's other stuff above this, but we're going to start right here. So, the 9-11 stuff, he's aware of it. That all of this stuff I'm going to address in future videos. But, this is where it started. Can't believe you unfriended me, laugh out loud. This was only Wednesday. Today's the Sabbath, so today's Saturday. And on Wednesday, he said, I can't believe you unfriended me. Well, there's this thing going around where he and Jordan are fighting about something. And so Jordan's telling people to unfriend him. Well, I put up my video about me not trusting Sean three months ago. So I put down, I don't keep people on my friends list that I don't trust and I don't trust you. Where did that all come from? Well, I took your advice and got him to change the intro. Okay, I've got a seven minute long video further up inside this thing that has, in seven minutes, it has a list of all the things that are bad in the video. Before Sean came back and said, here, I had the, re the video redone, the intro redone, what do you think of it now? Instead, he went out, and when I'm saying he laughed off, the advice and he's saying I went straight to the guy and got him to change it and then you didn't come back to me and say hey did he actually change it so you went to a, a whole group of people and said I want your opinions even though it, somebody else has already told me that there's evil stuff in this give me approval from the from the peanut gallery that this is okay it still has an XXX in the logo. That's a 666 using the Pythagorean free, uh, gematria that the Freemasons use. That XXX that the bad guys use is a 666, and Sean still got it in his logos. Now, Sean said that he took my advice and that he stopped doing all the bad stuff, right? Sean's going to mention that he took out these three pyramids out of the intro, but now he's using them in a thumbnail. Yesterday when I took this screenshot, it was five days ago, so today would be six days ago. Sean's still using these logos that I've already explained. I've got a whole playlist explaining how the chevrons and triangles and pyramids and all that stuff work together this is the same it, this would be the equivalent of the sign of fire 
Watch. So we're going to put together stuff that's going to be covered later on. So you guys see these triangles and how they're stacked and how they're chevrons and that stuff, right? If we come down here to five months ago in the playlist, we have a video that's called Sean Foyt, Rick Pino, Alchemical Hermetic Magic. That symbol is the symbol for fire. Okay. Now, later on in the video, 119 Ministries is going to be talking about that during the time of the Colossian heresy, those people were practicing elemental magic. That's what this is. Stoicheon, the, the four elements, earth, wind, fire, soul, and something, I don't know. That's what this is. So when you see Sean Christie have three triangles stacked up on each other, it would be the equivalent of him screaming, fire, 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 in mystical traditions. You guys understand? So this triangle that Sean, that Sean Foyt is using and Rick Pino is using that is hermetic magic is the exact same hermetic magic that's being used right here to get your attention, to pay attention to scripture twisting confusion from Benny Hinn from revealing truth. Okay. So fire, fire, fire. You can also go in and, and watch other videos that explain that the chevrons are hidden number 33. Once you do the, Hold on, so right here, if we turned this picture sideways, the empty space above the pyramid would make chevrons. Those chevrons come over here to the second one, the second playlist over, and it explains the pyramids. The third playlist over explains the chevrons that are going on inside the church. So when I say that Sean laughed off what's going on, in my opinion, Sean laughed it off. He doesn't find any harm in the symbolism. He doesn't understand occultism. He doesn't understand that that's magic. It's no different than if he was throwing up devil horns himself. It's occultism that's made to get your mind to pay attention to the symbols. So, I took your advice and got him to change the intro. Where did all that come from? Years and years of experience talking, Sean. So, I did what you suggested. I made a video, in, and you made a video anyways. Wow, you're no different than Jordan Riley and are causing division for no reason. Shame on you, Brian. You are a liar and a slanderer. I took your advice. I didn't laugh it off. You're a liar. So, I replied back. According to scripture, and that's the litmus test is scripture, Sunday worshipers are not a part of the body that would be considered causing divisions would pertain to that. Because what Sean is doing is claiming to be inside the faith but he's throwing away the faith. He thinks that just a belief in Jesus and claiming Jesus will end in good things for him. So, he said, you're a liar. You're not, in, and I wrote back, you're not in charge of anything. He had told me to take it down. He said, shame on you. You are spreading lies. Did you watch the whole video? So Sean started writing me back and telling me I had to take stuff down two minutes after I sent him the video that's about why I stopped trusting him. Well, if he's writing me back telling me in two minutes that I need to take down the video instantly, then he obviously hasn't watched the video that's 12 minutes long in two minutes. This is standard with Sean Christie. Sean has a discernment channel 
but he makes everybody else do the research for him. If you come and say, hey, I've got this thing, he wants you to go and pinpoint exactly what it is for him. He wants you to do all the work for him, and all he is is a spokesman for bad theology. So, he claims that the 911 thing is nothing to do with the um, Templars, but I've got pictures from all the way back in April of 2021 that show that he's known about the 9-11 stuff, and maybe not the 9-11 as 9-11, maybe he skipped over the understanding of IXXI equals 9-11, maybe he skipped over that part. But that just means that I've been teaching someone the ways to be able to identify this stuff, and he's completely ignored it. But in his video, he said, I appreciate Brian's research. But at the same time, his exposing, exposing Bethel video says that I called him out as being a Freemason, which I only have been pointing out his Freemason habits. I have not vocally said Sean is a Freemason. What I have been doing is showing the places in Sean's discernment ministry where he is using Freemason habits. You can't get away from it. If you're doing the habit, you can see the habit. People are coming over and saying, oh, look at Michael at Olive Branch. He's speaking with his hands too. There's a difference between an Italian who speaks with their hands, like they throw their hands up in um, emotional stuff, and somebody who speaks sign language, like actual English as a second language kind of sign language. Like there's a real actual method to what's going on that's already predetermined and it's a language, right? So the Freemasons have a language that is spoken with their hands. And if you would like to learn that language, as far as seeing the Freemason pastors using that, I've already done extensive research to help you guys be able to figure out which pastors and which of the YouTubers are using symbolism that comes from Freemasonry and hand signs that have their origins in Freemasonry. Now, people could accidentally do hand signs that are Freemason. I, I'm not above it. I actually had a picture up where I had the praying hands that are a Freemason hand sign, and I had a black Band-Aid under my left eye in the picture. The same as all these other Satanists. But the difference is, I know where that picture came from, and the photographer was a guy named Silver Moon. Now, at the time, I did not understand that silver was um, Lucifer worship and gold was Satan worship, and I didn't know that moon was Lucifer worship and sun was Satan worship. So this guy's Silver Moon Photography, which he's not a follower of Yeshua, so I hadn't brought this stuff up because... I can't attack the guy, right? We're not to judge those outside the church. So, but he's the one that posed me into that pose. So he knew what he was doing. So somebody does know what's going on regardless. So Sean saying that he's not doing Freemason hand signs is incorrect. He may not be aware of it. That's what I've been saying the whole time. So, let's keep going on this. Oh, I'm always paranoid, you guys. I see symbols everywhere. Right? You're a liar and a slanderer, and it was changed immediately. Shame on you. You are, are paranoid of everything being a sign of something evil. I feel sorry for you, bro. This says, I will expose your lies, okay? Because you are lying. That's a fact. And the guy that did the logo can verify that. Okay, I've already covered that part. I'm not slandering. I'm just observant of what fruit 
comes from which trees. You lied. I changed it right away the same day. Because you are lying, that's a fact. So this one I'm going to be able to... That's a fact. The guy that did the logo. This is my reply back. I think I made you a list of three or four satanic parts of that video and you fixed one. So he, in his video showing that I'm a liar, he fixed two. He got rid of the, the checkerboard floors and he got rid of the pyramids going up and the pyramids going down. But the X's are still there that are the 666. And one of the X's has an arrow above it pointing up and an arrow above it pointing down because it's as above, so below hermetic magic. So, this is what I replied back to you that I think you, I made a list of three or four satanic parts to that video and you fixed one, maybe. So this is me and him talking before he even made the video, the two days before he made the video. That still doesn't explain why so many of your habits are false according to scripture. Now, Sean's supposed to have a discernment ministry, and he's, supposed, he's been telling me that he and I are brothers. I'm coming to him and telling him that his interpretation of Colossians that throws away that allows Paul to throw away the law of Torah is incorrect. It's a very common teaching that's even got the name the Colossian heresy. He said, "You're crazy. My habits and teachings are not false. You are. Take care." So he instantly just shut down the whole conversation. He doesn't want to be corrected. He just wants to have people agree with his preconceived or pre-thought or pre-taught ideas. My reply back to him was, all Sunday worship is pagan. The habits in those churches also reflect pagan origins. The faith once preached doesn't exist in Sunday worship cults. So we can go over here to Truth Unedited, put in the word pagan. We scroll down here. We understand the moment paganism mixed with Christianity. The point in history when Saint Satan was planting his tares. There's no Sunday worship in the faith once preached, the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There's only a Sunday worship inside the pagan Christianity that has nothing to do with, if you have put on Messiah, there's no Jew nor Greek, right? That means there is no Christian either. We are all one in Messiah if we've put on Messiah, but these people are claiming to be Christianity and this video will explain to you where the Christian term even came from. It's not, it, so according to scripture, the covenant is with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. There's no, there's no covenant, no Torah, no agreement of Yah with his people that connects to Christianity. Those people are practicing paganism. Sunday worship pagans are the ones that do Christmas and Easter and all those holidays when we are Torah observant supposed to be keeping the Moedim, the Kodesh, the set apart holy feast dates. So these people who practice Sunday worship go by these things, okay? We're still working on Sean's being a pagan because he's doing Sunday worship stuff. One second. So, back to this. The faith once preached doesn't exist in Sunday worship cults. To the law and the testimony. So, to the Old Testament plus the New Testament. Or to the prophets and apostles that 
were in scripture and their proclamation that Yeshua had fulfilled scripture and fulfilled the prophecies. So to the law and the testimony, if a man doesn't come at teaching, teaching according to these words, there is no truth in him according to Isaiah 8.20, I think. So if there is no truth in him and Yeshua says, my words are truth, that means that there are no words of the Messiah inside of a person. So no Torah and no Holy Spirit if there is no words of Messiah. So he writes back, this is where the, the Colossian heresy happens. You are nuts. I'm nuts. He dismissed everything that I just said that was actual scripture. And he wants to do this. Colossians 2.16, therefore let, let, do not let anyone judge you by what you are eating or drinking or with regard to religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. Oh, I knew you would want to play Bible verse ping pong. Peter very clearly warned us that Paul's words are hard to understand and that many twist Paul's words to make him appear lawless as they twist the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. Sunday worshipers have thrown out the law. So, so when Sean one day ago came over here and attacked me and said, Sean Christie is an unsaved Freemason, question mark, Right? So he is implying that I have said that he is unsaved and a Mason. Just stop. I'm not responding anymore. I pray you get saved. So Sean's implying that I told you guys that he was unsaved. He just said, I pray you get saved. So I went over here and put Sean is just Sean, you are just as dangerous as Bethel, and your stiff neck is proving that. And he laughed. He put the little laughing emoji. So I sent him a link for the difficult words of Paul because we're trying to build up our brothers, right? I'm not trying to tear him down. This was me responding to him putting up the laughing emoji. I don't laugh when I think of people's souls. No Sunday worship in scripture. I sent him the link for that video. He replied back, you must be a Seventh-day Adventist, I'm guessing. So me looking at all of his bad actual stuff and him coming to the conclusion that even though I'm pointing out his habits that are Masonic, he gets to jump to the conclusion that I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. I replied back, you people, which is general, this kind of, I'm a Christian YouTuber exposer person, that's the you people, you people and you're jumping to conclusions junk. So Yeshua HaMashiach was a Seventh-day Adventist because he kept commandment number four to keep the Sabbath holy, Kodesh, set apart. So when he's saying I'm Seventh-day Adventist, I'm going, no, this is the Hebrew faith, Sean, the faith once preached. That which we are to earnestly contend for once preached means it just needs to be read out loud okay so now that we have what sean did you know what's funny he's gotten seven thousand views on this in one day and i won't get seven thousand views in a whole year <laughs> i'm just 
this is the kind of stuff that I'm dealing with where people are puffed up by their egos and because I have a big following that makes me right. So we're going to go over here and now that we've established what Sean has said, actually hold on. So the triangles and squares were removed, but the little plus signs were kept. So once again, his comment at the very start saying I laughed it off was not true. And apparently, I... Do you guys notice that he's going into stuff that is posts on his posts? When I'm doing this, I'm doing it in front of the group of people... When I call him out, I'm doing it in front of the group of people who are watching his videos. I'm expecting people to come back and try and challenge what I'm saying. But what I do is I put the whole information in one spot so that you guys can find it all. Lack discernment and am a blind man leading other blind people into a ditch. So let's hear some more of what he has to say. He laughed it off, and now he's asking his crowd what they think about his new intro. So this is something that I noticed randomly. I'm quite sure that on a full-size computer, that mess masthead banner probably says revealing truth. Isn't it interesting that on the phone versions, it always says that he is the one that's veiling truth. He's the one covering truth, at least on the cell phone versions. I of the Templars. Sean told me back when he, when we started talking like three or four years ago, he would never expose the Freemasons. That's also an outright lie. Three or four years ago, he would never expose the Freemasons. That's also an outright lie. I never said any such thing. Here's. Thanks, but you know I'll never do a video on any of the stuff with Freemasons and codes. Sure sounds like he's not going to do anything on Freemasons and codes. So he doesn't want to, he, he would end up saying there are Freemasons, bad Freemasons, go, go, Freema but he won't get into how do you determine who a Mason is. I won't go into the stuff that would expose the bad guys. I'll, I'll acknowledge that there are bad guys. Thanks. But you know I'll never do a video on any of this stuff with Freemasons and Codes. April 11th, 2021. Sean told me back when he, when we started talking like three or four years ago, he would never expose the Freemasons. That's also an outright lie. I never said any such thing. Here's a shot of my YouTube studio. It shows which videos have been published and which videos have been uploaded but not yet been made public. Here's a video I did on May 20th, but I haven't yet released it on why Chris... Here's a video I did a while back exposing Freemasons that I never put out publicly. Why, Sean? Right. You're not allowed to. Christians can't be Freemasons. And what inspired that video? I'm going to go on a bit of a rabbit trail, but remember Ramon and the healing testimony he gave on March 14th? Well... I got him a job as a chef at my friend's restaurant, and on May 19th, I ordered a burger, but for some reason, he refused to make it. I got pretty upset because not only was this ridiculous, but he was also taking income away from my friend's business. And after our dispute, for some reason, he felt the need to send me this message, saying that as of the 10th of May, he was accepted as a Freemason. So please keep Ramon in your prayers because Jesus healed him and he turned his back on Jesus to join this cult. But that was the inspiration to make that video about Freemasons on May 20th, just the day after. And it was just this morning, June 6, 2024, that I noticed he's unfriended me. 
And that's when I saw this video he made on me. For now you have to remember when he came and said, I can't believe you unfriended me. This is all based on Sean having a fight with Jordan Riley that has nothing to do with me, right? So I have already done a video probably a year ago that explained the same logos that are in Sean's video are the same logos that um, Jordan Riley is using. They're all using Freemason habits. They're all teaching a Freemason doctrine. Even if he just said flat earth doesn't exist and it's a globe, that's Freemason doctrine. That is straight out of the Kabbalah. That is the exact same thing that Bethel Church is teaching and indoctrinating people into. You're just in a different book, chapter, and verse, dude. Globe Earth is Kabbalah. You teaching or mocking people who believe in flat earth. It's self-explanatory, Sean. The f all the stuff that's the globe earth, later on when they start talking about the Stoicaeon and that stuff, it's all connected inside the Kabbalah. It's all the stuff that Bethel is teaching. It's all the same stuff that comes from your Sunday worship. It's not found inside the scriptures. So let's get back to Sean and the um, Colossian heresy because we really should have stayed on topic for that part. So we should, this is where we stopped, was that he was praying that I get saved. I'm not responding anymore. I pray you get saved. Sean, you're just as dangerous as Bethel and just as stiff-necked, and you're proving it. So, we need to get back to you. You're nuts. Colossians 2.16 so Sean's using this to be able to say, I don't have to keep the Sabbath anymore. I don't have to keep the laws anymore. They're done. This is called the Colossian heresy. What Sean is doing is established false doctrine. One second, I'll go get you guys the proof. I'm not going to tell you guys that I agree 100% with everything these guys say in all of their ministerial stuff that they're doing. But this is one of the topics that I've researched and that they've presented and our understanding of what is going on in scripture that Paul's presenting to the Colossians matches together. And this guy ends up explaining what the Colossian heresy is. That's how I even identify that there was a Colossian heresy. Sean challenged me trying to use a scripture. I said, I'm going to be a Berean and go and show you how that verse does not work in the way that you're trying to use it. That's where I found these guys, which I already know 119 Ministries. I've watched plenty of their stuff. This is a good teaching as far as figuring out that what Sean is trying to believe is incorrect. teaching from 119 Ministries. Our ministry believes that the whole Bible is true and directly applicable to our lives today. If you would like to know more about what we believe and teach, please visit us at testeverything.net. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel by hitting the button down below. We hope you enjoy studying and testing the following teaching. teach that God's laws about the Sabbath, festivals, and foods have become irrelevant to believers in the Messiah? Many have said yes, citing Colossians 2, 16-17 as proof. Let's take a look at these two verses. Colossians 2, 16-17. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. As we can see, Paul refers to things like the Sabbath and festivals as shadows that point forward to Christ. Based on these verses, some argue that now that Christ, the substance, has come, the shadows are no longer of any importance. Those commandments were set aside and nailed to the cross. Consequently, since these parts of the Torah are now irrelevant, we shouldn't let anyone judge us for not observing them, or so the argument goes. Pastor John MacArthur's comments are representative of the traditional interpretation of these verses. 
don't let anybody hold you to a Sabbath. And that's referring to the weekly Sabbath, because the other festival Sabbaths are covered under the term festival and new moon. Don't let anybody hold you to the Sabbath. It was part of the system that included the temple, the priesthood, the sacrifices. It's gone. It was only the shadow, not the substance. Paul is saying you no longer need the shadow, you have the substance. Is that really what Paul is saying in Colossians? Does he declare commands like the Sabbath and festivals to be irrelevant now that Messiah has come? That seems unlikely for a couple of reasons. First, such an interpretation doesn't fit with the broader biblical witness of Paul's perspective on these commandments. First, such an interpretation doesn't fit with the broader biblical witness of the substance. Is that really what Paul is saying in Colossians? Does he declare commands like the Sabbath and festivals to be irrelevant now that Messiah has come? That seems unlikely for a couple of reasons. First, such an interpretation doesn't fit with the broader biblical witness of Paul's perspective on these commandments. For instance, throughout the New Testament, we see that Paul regularly attended and participated in the synagogue services on the Sabbath. Luke records that Paul's custom was to worship on the Sabbath. Moreover, we see Paul expressing a desire to be in Jerusalem for the Feast of Shavuot, or Pentecost. In 1 Corinthians 5, 7-8, Paul instructs his readers on how they are to observe Passover. Based on Paul's behavior and teaching elsewhere in Scripture, it's difficult to imagine him thinking that these parts of the Torah became irrelevant in light of the Messiah's coming. Instead, these examples of Paul observing and teaching these commandments are what we would expect if he believed they were still important. Second, the false teaching Paul addresses in Colossians is characterized as, quote, according to human tradition. It is, quote, according to human precepts and teachings. That description does not seem to apply to the Sabbath, festivals, and dietary laws. Those things were not human teachings. They were commanded by God. Moreover, this false teaching is characterized further as being, quote, not according to Christ. But we know that Christ affirmed every iota and dot of the Torah as having enduring authority in the lives of his followers. He said his followers are to do and teach even the least of the Torah's commandments. When we consider Paul's record of observing the biblical Sabbath and festivals, along with the fact that in Colossians 2 he is coming against what he calls human teachings, it seems strange that he would discourage Sabbath, festival, and dietary law observance in Colossians 2 verses 16 through 17. But aside from simply doubting the traditional interpretation of these verses, do we have any good reasons for accepting an alternative interpretation? To understand Paul's admonition here, it might help us to gain a fuller understanding of what scholars call the Colossian heresy. What was this heresy that Paul counters in his letter? The Colossian heresy. Paul warned the Colossian believers about a false doctrine that certain people were teaching. We are given a description of this false doctrine in Colossians 2 verse 8. Colossians 2 verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. The false doctrine influenced... Okay, one second, we gotta back that up. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ, according to Yeshua the Messiah. Don't let elemental spirits, right? And we just talked about Sean Foyt using the hermetic magic logo of fire being the triangle, and that Sean Christie doing the three triangles is fire, 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 and that has to do with this elemental magic. If you come over here to the Bethel playlist, it's called the Pyramid in the Octagon, Bethel's Alabaster Prayer House. It's going to go down here, and you're going to see the video that is, does your church use a compass? But then this one right here, Elemental Magic, Bethel Redding, and Toby Mac. That same Elemental Magic is what Bethel is doing. And the people who were practicing this Elemental Magic were practicing the Colossian Heresy, 
that Sean Christie from Revealing Truth is practicing, the origin of their heresy is the same location. These people who were elemental magicians, if you come over here to the playlist, it's called Bethel Freemason Habits. You come down here, and this one says, NAR leaders get blue angels like masons get blue angels, okay? Pay attention to those two things because those are important when it comes to what 119 Ministries is about to say. So we're at 527 in the video. I'm going to back it up a little bit. Paul warned the Colossian heresy. What was this heresy that Paul counters in his letter? The Colossian heresy. Paul warned the Colossian believers about a false doctrine that certain people were teaching. We are given a description of this false doctrine in Colossians 2 verse 8. Colossians 2 verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. The false doctrine influencing believers at Colossae is characterized first as philosophy and empty deceit. The Greek term translated philosophy, philosophia, generally carries the sense of manner of life and often addresses ethics. For instance, Josephus describes the Essenes, Sadducees, and Pharisees as different sects of philosophy. In the Hellenistic Jewish literature, the word takes on what the scholar Nijay Gupta calls a moralistic edge. He writes, A number of texts presume that a good and true philosophy has the ability to restrain sin and control wanton passions and desires. Gupta cites three historical sources that demonstrate this idea. For instance, in 4 Maccabees, written in the 1st or 2nd century AD, Antiochus pressures the Jews to eat unclean foods. Eliezer defends the dietary laws of the Torah, as well as Judaism more broadly, calling it our philosophy. You scoff at our philosophy as though living by it were irrational, but it teaches us self-control so that we master all pleasures and desires, and it also trains us in courage so that we endure any suffering willingly. According to the letter of Aristeas, written in the 3rd or 2nd century BC, Ptolemy asked the question, what is philosophy? To which a Jewish sage responds, to deliberate well in reference to any question that emerges, and never to be carried away by impulses, but to ponder over the injuries that result from the passions, and to act rightly as the circumstances demand, practicing moderation. Philo, a 1st century Jewish philosopher, also has some relevant remarks. Philosophy teaches temperance with regard to the belly, and temperance with regard to the parts below the belly, and also temperance and restraint of the tongue. These historical sources give us an idea of what Paul means by the word philosophy. Broadly, it's a manner of life intended to develop self-control. The doctrine influencing the Colossian believers could be considered a type of philosophy, but according to Paul, it is empty deceit. It doesn't actually deliver what it promises. Paul says it is of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Another problem with this false teaching is that it is according to human tradition. From Paul's perspective, mere human teachings are useless in overcoming the power of sin. Finally, this false teaching is according to the elemental spirits of the world, which likely refers to spiritual beings that were believed to have control over nature and the cosmos. Philo writes about nations that made divinities out of the four elements of earth, water, air, and fire. The Wisdom of Solomon, a book written in the first century BC, speaks similarly about ignorant people who believe that the elements, such as wind, fire, water, and so forth, were gods who ruled the world. Passages from the Pseudepigrapha and Dead Sea Scrolls give some additional evidence of these types of ideas floating around the Judaisms of the Second Temple era. It appears that the false teachers at Colossae were enamored with cosmic authorities, supernatural powers over nature, and angels. They exalted and feared these spiritual entities, believing them to have control over the universe and their destinies. These superstitions were also combined with religious practices, including biblical holy days. In practice, the false philosophy strictly regulated foods, drinks, and festivals, and involved ascetic rituals and worship of angels. By adhering to the practices and regulations of these false teachers, people believed they could attain wisdom and be protected from the evil spirits that troubled them. Hippolytus of Rome, a late 2nd slash early 3rd century Christian theologian, wrote about the heretical teaching of a man named Elchisai. 
Elkasai's teaching gives us a fitting parallel to what we see happening at Colossae, where some teachers mixed elements of Judaism with astrological beliefs and practices. Citing Hippolytus, the scholar Clinton Arnold writes this. There is one figure... So, the group that's using the astrological signs is Bethel. The alabaster prayer house is an astrological clock. They're practicing the, the Babylonian Kabbalah. People who are practicing Sunday worship are practicing Kabbalah. Who may help us better understand how about the heretical teaching of a man named Elkasai. Elkasai's teaching gives us a fitting parallel to what we see happening at Colossae, where some teachers mixed elements of Judaism with astrological beliefs and practices. Citing Hippolytus, the scholar Clinton Arnold writes this. There is one figure who may help us better understand how a Christian teacher may have combined magical, astrological, Jewish, and local pagan cult traditions into a new teaching. At the end of the first century, during the time of Trajan, a Christian leader named Elkasai combined aspects of Jewish gnomism, circumcision, and law observance with astrological beliefs and practices. The resultant secretistic teaching emphasized the hostility of the stars, viewed as angels, and the need to regulate one's life according to the calendar, especially the Sabbath and the courses of the moon. Colossae was certainly not afflicted by the teaching of Elkasai, but the philosophy bore many similarities. At the minimum, the example of Elkasai points to emerging forms of localized syncretistic Christianity at an early stage. The Elkasite teaching also demonstrates how a magical slash astrological interpretation of Sabbaths could surface in early Christianity. In summary, the false teaching at Colossae was a type of philosophy, a manner of life intended to develop self-control. But according to Paul, it failed to deliver what it promised because it was according to mere human tradition, and it wrongly exalted elemental spirits and powers. It incorporated the observance of some biblical practices mixed with ascetic rituals. A big problem with this mystical false teaching is that it ultimately resulted in minimizing the Messiah's exalted position as the head from whom the body derives its life. These false teachers worshipped angels and tried to appease the elemental spirits instead of looking to the Messiah. So, how does Paul counter this false teaching? He proclaims the preeminence of the Messiah. Paul teaches that the Messiah is the real embodiment of wisdom and knowledge. Messiah is the image of the invisible God, that is, God's full character is embodied in Messiah. Messiah is the firstborn of all creation, which is an Old Testament title expressing royal status and authority. It was by, through, and for Messiah that all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. Importantly, the invisible creations in heaven would include angelic beings. Paul's point is that Messiah, the one by whom, through whom, and for whom all things were created, has authority and power over all created things in heaven and on earth. Messiah is before all things, and in him all things hold together. That is, Messiah has priority in terms of time and rank, and he is the sustainer of the universe. Paul hopes to encourage the Colossian believers not to try to find coherence in the universe by turning to angels. Messiah is the one who holds all things together. Messiah is also the head of the body, the church. That is, he is the Lord over the church as well as its source of life. The head from whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows with the growth that is from God. Messiah is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. The Messiah's resurrection has inaugurated the kingdom, his resurrection being the first fruits, assuring us of the full harvest to come at the end of the age. In the meantime, the Messiah exercises his rule through his body, the church. The Messiah is one in whom all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. As F.F. F. Bruce puts it, all the attributes of God, his spirit, word, wisdom, and glory are disclosed in him. Paul made this proclamation to set the record straight about who was really in charge. He wanted to warn the Colossian believers not to be led astray by mystical teachings involving things like angel worship. His concern was that these false teachings relegated the Messiah, who is head over all rule and authority in creation, to the theological background. Thus, Paul encouraged the Colossian believers to look to the Messiah alone to satisfy their yearning for spiritual fulfillment. This is why he goes to some length to express the supremacy of the Messiah. 
Paul makes one more significant point in his argument for the Messiah's preeminence. He proclaims that only the Messiah's work on the cross provides forgiveness of sin and reconciliation with God. Redemption cannot be found anywhere else, least of all through a strict observance of ascetic rituals to appease angelic powers. The Messiah's work also had the effect of defeating the spiritual rulers and authorities. To demonstrate his point about redemption and reconciliation, Paul uses the metaphors of circumcision, baptism, and the record of debt. Paul's circumcision metaphor here expresses our dying in Messiah's death, that is, putting off the body of the flesh. Paul then moves to baptism to express our being buried and rising in union with Messiah in his burial and resurrection. When we put our faith in the Messiah, we die with him, enter his tomb with him, and are raised with him. The third metaphor Paul uses, the record of debt, has caused some confusion. Some have supposed Paul teaches that Messiah took away the Torah and nailed it to the cross. Let's look at the passage. Colossians 2, 13 through 14. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. The interpretation that Messiah set aside the Torah is unlikely. First, the Greek word that the New Testament always uses to refer to the Torah, nomos, is nowhere to be found in this passage. Second, the idea that Messiah took away the Torah doesn't fit with Paul's argument. How would getting rid of the Torah assure forgiveness of sins? That simply doesn't follow. A better interpretation is that the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands refers to the record of our sins and the punishment required for them. God's Torah legally demands death as payment from those who break it. However, the Messiah has canceled our record of sins that stood against us. The Messiah did not cancel the law, but rather the written record of our transgressions of the law because he provided forgiveness for the sins that we had committed. By canceling the record of our sins, the Messiah disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. That is, he has removed any power these spiritual forces might have had over us. Therefore, we need not seek out the wisdom or protection from any inferior spiritual entities. The Messiah has already provided everything we need. Now that we have a better understanding of the false teaching in Colossians and Paul's answer to it, let's turn again to Paul's admonition concerning certain Torah commandments. Colossians 2, verses 16 through 17. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Once again, this passage is traditionally interpreted to mean that the Sabbath, festivals, and so forth are now irrelevant in light of the Messiah. Therefore, the Colossian believers should not be judged for not observing them. But based on what we've learned about the false teachings Paul is dealing with, it seems clear that there is more going on here. Paul state that the commandments are invalid. He states that the judgment of these false teachers is invalid. A better understanding, which is consistent with the context, is that the Colossian believers are not to accept judgment from these false teachers regarding how to observe these commandments. The false teachers at Colossae applied esoteric meanings and ascetic rituals to these Torah commandments and judged those who didn't follow their teachings as unenlightened. Paul says not to accept their judgment. Their form of Torah observance is really no Torah observance at all. It's a false religion mixed with a distorted misuse of the Torah. The scholar Douglas Moo likewise has recognized that these aspects of the Torah have been connected to a broader religious philosophy in Colossians. On the whole, then, it seems best to view the practices in verse 16 as basically Jewish in origin and perhaps even orientation, while still recognizing that they have been taken up into a larger mix of religious ideas and practices. In other words, proper observance of these Torah commands was not the problem in Colossians. The problem was that false teachers had mixed things like the Sabbath and festivals with their mystical teachings. Paul's admonition to the Colossian believers, then, is not to accept judgment on these matters from these false teachers. These false teachers misuse and distort the biblical commandments in their worship of various cosmic powers over which the Messiah has triumphed. Again, the problem is the perversion of these Torah commands within a false religious philosophy, not the commands themselves, as the scholar Peter O'Brien puts it. For Israel, the keeping of these holy days was evidence of obedience to God's law and a sign of her election among the nations. At Colossae, however, the sacred days were to be kept for the sake of the elemental spirits of the universe, 
those astral powers who directed the course of the stars and relegated the order of the calendar. So Paul is not condemning the use of sacred days or seasons as such. It is the wrong motive involved when the observance of these days is bound up with the recognition of the elemental spirits. This added context perhaps could bring some clarity to what Paul means in verse 17. Let's read it again. Colossians 2:17. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Here, Paul says that things like the Sabbath and festivals serve as shadows pointing toward the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. That is, these aspects of the Torah ultimately are intended to reveal the work of the Messiah. Notice that Paul says these Torah commandments are a shadow of things to come, not just things that have already happened. These commands function not only in memorializing Yeshua's work of atonement on the cross, but also continue to point forward to his future work to occur at the end of the age. Paul's point is that the Sabbath, festivals, and so forth were intended to point beyond themselves to the Messiah, who is the substance. They were not meant to be the end in themselves, and they definitely were not meant to be used in angel worship. As we've seen, like other difficult passages in which it appears on the surface that Paul diminishes the value of the Torah, a closer look at Colossians 2, 16-17 reveals that he spoke against only a misuse of the Torah, not the Torah itself. In conclusion, a contextual understanding of these verses implies that Paul does not regard things like the Sabbath and festivals as unimportant. He condemns only an improper observance of these laws in connection with mystical false teachings that downplay Messiah and his work. Once again, the problem was with human precepts and teachings, not God's commandments themselves. But when we observe these parts of the Torah appropriately, with a focus on the Messiah and his work of redemption, there's no problem. In fact, recognizing the substance that these shadows point to ought to make us value them that much more. We pray that you've been blessed by this teaching, and remember, continue to test everything. Shalom. So, I'm nuts, because Colossians 2.16 Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regards to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath. Because I have a biblical understanding of something, and Sean is using the Colossian heresy. I'm nuts. And all of his viewers have been telling me that since the video that exposed him. Now, if he'd have been honest with integrity when I sent him, like, you guys have to understand this whole being able to read the signs and symbols stuff, I've been able to do it at least for four years because I've been teaching him for four years. He should be an expert at being able to pick these things out because I've taught him and he hasn't listened, obviously, because if he's not going to listen to scripture that says that the, to the law and the testimony, if a man doesn't come speaking according to these things, there's no truth in him. There's no truth means Yeshua said, my words are spirit and truth. And the Holy Spirit, that means there's no Holy Spirit inside. When Yeshua had... Um, was it his apostles came in, somebody came in while he was healing and, and said, your brother and your sister and your mother are outside. And Jesus looked around, he pointed towards his apostles and he said, those are my brothers and my sisters. So when I'm trying to use a litmus test of scripture and Yeshua says, my brothers and sisters are those who are doing the will of the Father, and the will of the Father is the Torah, then I don't assign the word brother or sister, the title brother or sister, to anybody that's not at least Torah observant. If you're not on the basic milk level understanding of Scripture, I will not call any Sunday worshipers my brothers and sisters, if, and that's not me condemning anybody that a lake of fire. That's me saying, according to Yeshua, his litmus test for determining who a brother and sister was, was whether or not the people were doing the will of the Father, and the will of the Father is the laws of Moses, or the laws of Torah given to us through Moses. The laws of the Torah are the conditions 
of the covenant that Yah has with his people. If you've thrown out the law of Torah, you've thrown out the conditions of the marital agreement that you are claiming to be. If you're claiming to be a Christian, you're claiming to be the bride of Messiah, but you've thrown out the law, you don't have the conditions to be able to do that. And you're going to say, but the conditions are written on my heart. How does that happen if you are throwing out the words that are his Torah? The dispensational theology people and the Sunday worship people have said, the law is done away with, Messiah fulfilled it. He did. Pleroma. He fulfilled. He, if you had a, uh, you were making a loaf of bread, right? And it has a recipe. And you fulfill that recipe. You put first the flour and then the water and then the eggs and then the raising agent. As you fulfill that, Yeshua fulfilled the Torah Yeshua exampled the wedding covenant between his bride and himself perfectly so that the people who wanted to be part of his, be the bride of Messiah, had an example in Messiah that would allow them to copy him. He said that he only came speaking the Father's words. He said, do you do you think that I came to do away with the law and the prophets? I didn't come to do away with the law and the prophets. I came to fulfill the law and the prophets. He came to bake the perfect loaf of bread. He came to give the perfect teaching of how to walk out the Torah. He fulfilled the Torah. I love you guys. We can't do the Sunday worship stuff. This is the faith once preached. Scripture says we are to earnestly contest, earnestly contest for the faith once preached. Once preached means it's already the things that are written in Scripture. It doesn't mean anybody's interpretation of that Scripture. It means the things that are written in Scripture should be adhered to. I love you guys. Shabbat Shalom. So, Sean, I'll be praying for you too. Maybe not that you get saved. Maybe I think that possibly you have some type of repentant heart because you're on some type of a journey. But we're not in the same family as far as it, it, if, if this is the wise virgins and the foolish virgins, possibly, but that means that you get cast into outer darkness which is just outside of Israel because that's where Yeshua will be the light in Israel. The sun and the moon will have stopped shining. And the people who have depart from me, I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. Those of you who have made a lifestyle of throwing out the Torah, depart from me, I never knew you. That's not me judging you. That's me quoting what Yeshua is going to say. Depart from me, I never knew you. If you lived a life that got rid of the conditions of our wedding agreement, you came into the wedding, but you didn't have on the proper clothing. Friend, how did you come in here not having the proper attire? I love you guys. Come out of the understandings of the beast of Babylon. They're even in the Christian truth or communities. I could get way deeper into this than I already have, but let's see if these guys stop here. And if not, we'll do round two. I love you guys. Come out of the beast. Shabbat Shalom. This was actually peaceful for me.